so I'm going to go ahead and get started. A few people are still trickling in. My name is TJ Van Toll. I work for a, a company called Telerik. If you haven't heard of us before, we're a software development company. We make a lot of web and mobile products. And I'm also a member of the jQuery team. I work on a, a number of the different jQuery projects, but I focus mostly on jQuery UI, which is part of what this talk is about today. And I want to start by asking everybody a question. Um, how many people in this room have a jQuery UI widget deployed in a production application? OK, so maybe third half the room. How many people are using one of the new HTML5 input types in a production application? OK, just a handful of people. And this is really what this talk is about. Um, it's talking about the situation that we have that's really kind of a recent problem on the web, where we have these native controls, things like input type date, um, and these JavaScript widgets that we've historically used, things like jQuery UI's date picker. And there's several examples of these, things like input type number versus spinner, uh, range controls, data lists. And for the first time, uh, we've kind of for years complained about these things not being available on the web. And now that we have them, we have this situation where as developers, we have to choose. Do we use the native controls or do we use the JavaScript widgets that we've been using for years? And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is I'm going to briefly summarize kind of the past, kind of how we got to this point. Then we'll look at some specific instances of this, compare things like the native date picker versus uh, jQuery UI's date picker. Then we'll kind of answer the most important question, what should you actually use today? What should you actually put in production? And then we'll take a brief look at what's being done at the spec level for the future to make these, the, some of the problems that we're going to talk about better for developers um, moving forward. So first, just to quickly discuss how we got here, um, I mean, historically, the building forms on the web has been a very painful process, and mostly because there's a very limited set of controls that we have available. If you look at this list, this is the entirety of form controls that are part of the HTML4 spec. And these five controls right here are all just different confusing aspects of buttons. So really all we have is text boxes, passwords, radios, checkboxes, you can get files, you have drop downs, you have text areas. And that's it. That's really all you have to build a form. Now, when these controls first came out back in like 1997, this wasn't much of a problem, right? You'd build an app and you, your CGI script could read your values and you'd be all excited. You'd go to high five your, high five your coworkers because it's like, man, yeah, like I, I could build a form. But a lot has changed in the last 15 years. I mean, that's no longer good enough. The whole profession of UX has made it to the web and has found that very, very small changes in your form, just making it easier for users to fill out, can make a big bottom line difference. It can mean a lot of money for your app. It could mean you retain users. You just make users happier by being, making forms easier to use. And as it turns out, that this is not a comprehensive set of data that you ever want to get from users. There's more things out there. Another thing happened in the last 15 years, and it's that we got a lot better at JavaScript. JavaScript went from a toy language where we were doing image rollovers and um, silly little things to really a robust language. And this was propelled by libraries like jQuery, but not only jQuery, things like MooTools and Prototype and Dojo and YUL, and all these libraries made things that we really couldn't think about doing before possible. So all of a sudden, it really came, became conceivable to build a calendar in JavaScript, and it made our forms a lot easier to use. Now, we did this for years. Um, jQuery UI is seven or eight years old at this point, and there was precursors to jQuery UI as well. Um, and eventually, the standards kind of came around on this sort of thing. So several years ago, a number of new input types, and this shows the date type in particular, were added to the specification. And then in the last handful of years, browsers have actually started to implement these controls. And so that's kind of how we got here. And we're kind of in the middle stage where browsers are still kind of implementing these. And it's st still a little bit of in a state of flux. So I want to look at some specific instances, kind of the most common conflicts, and kind of compare and contrast and show what are the advantages and disadvantages of these. Now, the first one I always bring up is the date picker. And I do this because it's the most common example. We know, for instance, from just download statistics. We do analytics on jQuery UI, and we know that the date picker is by far our most popular widget, almost two or three times more popular than any other one. So when you compare these head to head, it, the input type date, the native control, it's just as simple as giving a input a type of date, and you get, this is Chrome's implementation of this calendar, and then other browsers have different implementations. And jQuery UI is, of course, 
you get um, you select the element with a, uh, a selector and you call the date picker plugin and then you have a date picker. Now support for input type date isn't all that great at the moment. Uh, Chrome has had an implementation in it since Chrome 20, so it's been around for a while. A couple of the mobile browsers, iOS Safari has an implementation and Chrome for Android does as well. But at the moment, we still have no support in IE or Firefox, and we still have no support in the default Android browser. So it's kind of a hard sell to use across the board at this point. Um, so why would you want to use the native picker? Well, first of all, it's dependency free. Now, the previous example I showed, of course, the jQuery UI's date picker was just one line to, to call the plugin. But what you're not seeing is that you have to include jQuery core. You have to include the date picker plugin in order to use that. Uh, whereas the native picker works without any dependencies. It'll work when JavaScript isn't even available. The second is that it's easy to use. And not that these JavaScript widgets are necessarily hard to use, but think of it as a newcomer to the platform. If you wanted to explain how you want to build a date picker, if you're talking about how to build a JavaScript control, you have to talk about script tags, you have to get into all these things. Whereas a very basic input type date, that's pretty self-explanatory. And there's some other real advantages of these native controls as well. You get integrations into some other native features, things like the min, max, and step attributes. Now, for this example, I have a date here, and I'm saying that I want a date between March 3rd and March 20th. And it's up to the browser or the user agent how they actually want to implement this. And in Chrome in particular, and see how the, the contrast works here, but they actually gray out the month and the year for you since you can't actually select those because of the min and max constraints. So you can only type in the date. And then if you go into the full picker here, it's the same thing where they only allow certain days. Now the step attribute is kind of weird and I don't actually know why they allow this on date types, but for number type step makes a lot of sense because it's like you step by values of two, four, it, can, it controls uh, kind of the rate you step. But for date pickers, it's kind of weird, but you can do it. And in Chrome, it makes it so you have this checkerboard pattern so you can select every other day. One of the bigger reasons to do it is you also get ties into HTML5's native validation mechanism, which is known as constraint validation. Now some of this, before you actually look at the code too much, some of this is just implicit validation. Meaning, if I try to type in, say, a leap year, or I pick a date that's not actually a leap year, like this year, Chrome will actually prevent that that submission automatically. And how many people in this room have written leap year logic before? Yeah, this should be pretty good news to people who have done it, because I mean, it just feels so pathetic to, that we're writing this in 2014. And this is one thing that the browser will take care of it. I mean, it'll also take care of, it knows that, for instance, there are only 30 days in September, and it'll automatically stop that date from being submitted. Now, we also get the the full constraint validation API, which is a DOM API that extends some of the native validation features. And without getting too much into the details here, the, the method set custom validity does, does two things. It's kind of a weird API. It both tells the browser whether the field is invalid or valid. Empty string means valid, strangely enough. Non-empty string means invalid. And then you can also control the message that appears in that little validation bubble. So here I'm saying every time my field changes, if it has a seven in the field, I'm going to consider that invalid because I don't want any sevens. So if I try to put in, for instance, September 17th, the browser is going to automatically prevent that. And if I switch it up, the browser will take that value. One last uh, native integration is Dataless. And if you haven't seen Dataless, you can kind of think of them um, in, ten in terms of an autocomplete. They're basically suggestions. If you compare them to select boxes, when you use a select box, you're telling the user, you must pick one of these options, one of these options in the list. Whereas data list, they use the same option nodes, but they're suggestions. They're saying you might want to pick one of these values, but you can pick anything you'd like. This is another one where it's up to the browser to figure out how they want to implement it. And in Chrome, for instance, you get this, this dropdown with the options you provide. But since these are just suggestions, you also have access to this other menu that just brings up the full picker to let you pick whatever you want. But on top of all this, perhaps the biggest reason to use these native controls is that when you use them, you give control over to the browser. And you tell the browser, pick the best means you can to collect this data from the user, which can be really powerful, especially on mobile devices. And I have examples up here from iOS and Chrome for Android. But by giving control over to the browser, you can let them use the same pickers that their native OS uses. So in iOS, for instance, that's the same 
calendar widget you would use in the calendar app just natively on iOS. Which is great because remember the whole reason we're doing this is to make the, the forms easier to fill out for users and if you're giving them a, a control that they're already familiar with it's going to be far easier for them to use. Now this is all great and I talked about some pretty cool things that the native controls can do but there's also some real limitations. Um, basically they work great when you have a very simple use case. In the terms of input type date you just need a date from the user. But as soon as you start to need things that are more complex it becomes challenging or if not impossible to get what you need done done. And this is really no different than any other form control that we have out here. How many people in this room have tried to customize a select box? How did that go? Yeah, it's usually very painful. If you want to style them, it becomes a real mess. If you want to build things on top of it, if you want to extend it, it becomes really a problem. And with the, date, the input type date in particular, browser support is still a kind of an issue. I mean, very few apps don't even support IE or Firefox at all. Um, so just to take a quick look at jQuery UI's date picker to contrast, and I'll go through this kind of quickly, but date picker has, it'll provide all the same features that the native date picker will. You can do things like specify a minimum and maximum date. You can restrict the available days, so you can say things like, I don't want the user to pick any weekends. You can replicate what the step attribute can do. You can whitelist, blacklist days, things like that. You can theme the date picker, so you can pick an arbitrary theme. I don't even know what the start theme is. Apparently blue. You can do things like show multiple months. If you use some sort of travel site to book travel to this event, you almost certainly saw a calendar that worked kind of like this. You can do some animations. You can control how the date picker is shown. You can show and hide the date picker. And I like to include this one. I mean, this seems so silly, right? I'm showing and hiding a calendar. Like, woo! But I, I include this example to show, like, even something this trivial, just showing and hiding the picker, is something that you can't actually do with the native control. There's no way to explicitly say, I want to see the calendar, or I don't want to see the calendar. And along the same lines, you can't really do something like this, where you just put an ca inline calendar on the screen. Um, th these sort of things just aren't possible when you have more complex requirements. And of course, there's a lot more. There's probably too much that jQuery UI's date picker does, but there's a whole lot of options for customization out there. And the, the thing I really want to stress here is that the, the biggest advantage and disadvantage of these JavaScript widgets is that they're just HTML on the DOM. Now, the downside of being just HTML on the DOM is that that means they're exposed to any external scripts. So a, a malicious script or even just a, a script that's running wild can mess with your date pickers, can screw things up that you don't intend. There's no real good encapsulation at the moment. And this, al this also holds true from a CSS perspective. I even ran into trouble with this when building this slide deck, because it's an HTML-based slide deck, and I have selectors that are applied globally, and then they mess with the date picker, and they mess with these other JavaScript widgets, and then you have to figure out, like, oh, well, I didn't want my styling, global styling, to actually affect my widgets, and things like that. So it's kind of a big detriment of these controls. But on the flip side, this gives you all sorts of power. I mean, we have the full power of JavaScript at our potential. If you want to change the way the title bar is, just get your hands dirty, go in there, rip it out, throw in some new stuff. You can go nuts with this sort of thing. And to show that, I built this date picker using only CSS. This is CSS only. Um, I like it because it's, it's still a functioning date picker. Like You can still pick days. Um, so you can do sort of this sort of thing if this is what you choose to do. But I guess on a more practical note, that when you're using just HTML on the DOM, you can build something that's actually genuinely useful. This is something uh, someone on the jQuery mobile team came up with that's just um, wrapped the date picker a little bit and built something that was a little um, easier to use for mobile display. And so you don't get the benefits of, say, like the, the native calendar. Like you won't get iOS's way of picking dates. But you do get a full calendar, and you could go nuts with CSS, this kind of making it feel like your app or um, providing whatever functionality that you need to add to your application. So just as a brief comparison, when you look at the native controls, you're talking about something that's, that's easy to use, it's dependency free, you get these other ties. And with, with jQuery as date picker, you get something that you can actually build something on top of that's customizable, themable, and then you're also going to get browser support as well. The next question that usually comes up at this point is, well, 
can we kind of pick and choose? So we have, we have these kind of nice features on both sides of this. And it's, I kind of want the best of both worlds, right? I want the, the native controls, but then I want, to, I want the native validation, but then I want, kind of want my own custom date picker. And the, the kind of naive approach, the starting approach you take to doing this, it's like, oh, OK. Well, I'll just take my date input, and I'll just turn it into a date picker, right? And when you do that, you actually get this situation where you get two calendars. And the native one actually works. So this is obviously not an acceptable solution. So this is a problem. Now, there's one thing we can do to kind of make this situation better, and it's known as Shadow DOM. Uh, how many people Shadow DOM know the, know the term? OK, now, a couple people. Shadow DOM is part of a, a larger set of specifications known as web components. And it's really around um, building these components for the web to kind of add some of these encapsulation features that we were talking about that the web platform really doesn't have today. And I think it's far easier to actually show it in action. And if I go back to my example here and crank up my font size. Now in Chrome, you can expose the Shadow DOM. It's an option. If I scroll down here, under General, this Show Shadow DOM option. So there's a little checkbox for it. And when you have that enabled, normally input elements can't have children. You can't, it's, it's invalid HTML to put children elements within input nodes. But in Chrome, when I have that Show Shadow DOM flag set, you can see that actually within this input, I have a whole bunch of stuff here that's actually exposing Chrome's actual implementation of this native field. And what's kind of cool, if you look at this pseudo element thing, um, let me shrink this down a little bit. You can see as I hover over this that it's actually selecting individual components of that actual picker. And we can do things like apply CSS to these things to actually change the behavior of these native controls. So if we use this sort of approach, for instance, we can say, OK, that spin button, I don't want this to show up. And same thing with the picker indicator, get rid of that as well. And we're getting close now, because now we don't have any sort of uh, these ways of bringing up the native calendar. And if we do that, and we take the date picker, and we set its date format to the year, month, day, which is the same format that the HTML5 picker uses, we can get something that actually kind of sort of works in that the jQuery UI picker actually is controlling this native control. And you can do things too. There's two elements for all of these parts, so you could change the font and font size, things like that, if that's what you choose to do. Now, the problem, of course, here is that this solution is very specific to Chrome. Now, this was originally implemented in the WebKit's um, code base, so they're still behind these WebKit, these WebKit pseudo, pseudo element prefixes. But, of course, uh, when Presto used to have a input type date implementation, they had no pseudo elements available. And this example would almost certainly break when Firefox or IE roll out their support for input type date in the future. And in fact, if you try to use this on Opera 12, you'd still get the double, the double calendar thing. Same thing on iOS, two calendars there. And same thing for Chrome for Android as well. So unfortunately, the answer at the moment to this question is no, we really can't. You really just have to pick one of these controls or the other. Now, one thing you can do if you do just need a basic, if you just need a basic control, you just need a date from a user, jQuery UI actually makes for a good polyfill for this situation. So you can use whatever um, modernizer or whatever you'd like to detect whether native date support is available. And if it's not, you can actually only use date picker under, this, under these circumstances. So that way, you'll always have some sort of calendar control, but you'll use the native one where it's available. Now, that's the date picker one. I wanted to go through two more examples. Um, I'm going to go through these a little bit quicker, because you're going to find that the story is more or less the same. Next one I'm going to talk about is number pickers. And like date picker, or the, like the native date pickers, it's just a matter of giving a different type to an input. And I get these, if I hit up and down on the keyboard, the browser is automatically going to spin these controls. And jQuery I spinner works similarly. Now input type number support is actually a little bit better. Firefox will have support in 28, which should ship soon. It's in their nightly builds. Safari's had support for a while, and most of the, the mobile browsers have some support for it as well. The reasons to use the number picker are pretty much the same. 
get a control that's easy to use and without dependencies. You also get mobile optimized inputs. So this is what the number picker looks like on Chrome for Android. You can see you get kind of the, the dialer and some extra currency controls here. Same thing on iOS. iOS has a little trick too where if you know that you're only going to get just numbers, just digits, you won't have any decimals or commas or anything like that. You can give it a pattern attribute and you actually get the, the phone dialer here, which is pretty convenient. I love when I see this on websites because it Things for like credit card numbers and zip codes, things like that. IE10 Mobile has an implementation of well. I include this screenshot because I think it's kind of hilarious that um, IE10 Mobile will let you put in a smiley face into a number control. I don't, I don't think that's actually part of the specification, but. Opera Mobile, this was before they switched over to Blink. This is still using in the Presto rendering engine. They were the only mobile browsers that actually put these, these little plus and minus boxes that desktop browsers show. And the other mobile browsers don't do that. And I kind of have mixed feelings about it because it's kind of cool that they had support for those things. But at the same time, these things are like five pixels tall for a finger to hit. So I think that's why the other mobile browsers don't include them. And speaking of those min and max attributes, in, in this case, they're pretty common with number inputs. So back to hitting up and down on the keyboard, the browser will actually stop me at the min and max, so I can only go between 0 and 10. And you can see from the step value, it's stepping me by values of 2. You get the same hooks into the constraint validation API. So again, if I go under the min here, the browser will stop that and tell me, actually automatically provide a message for me that I can't actually go under that value. The same thing, the max is 10 here. If I try to go over it, it'll tell me that as well. And also for the step attribute as well. And I guess I should say one last thing too, is since it's a number type, it'll stop me for alphanumeric characters as well. Which is pretty cool because there's, there's really no extra code here. There's no magic JavaScript running that. These are all just pre-canned browser things that are built in now. You get data list integration as well. Chrome implements this pretty much like a typical autocomplete where you see the, these options in this little drop-down box, but of course it's, it's a data list so I can type whatever value I want into it. The limitations of input type number, it's, it's the same basic things. If you want to build things on top of it, you're going to have a lot of issues. And I guess to kind of show that, I want to briefly show jQuery UI spinner control, which is kind of the equivalent of this. So you get the same min, max, and steps in step support. The spinner widget will actually look at the attributes on the input type so that you don't have to specify them as options. It's themable, so I'm going to switch up my theme. I don't even really... Swanky purse. I wasn't around on the project when the theme names were chosen. Um, paging. So basically, when I hit the up and down keys, I'm moving by a value of 1 because that's the default step value. But you can also page using the page up and page down keys. And I'll show you why this is kind of cool in a second. But we'll get back to that. But where this, controls like this get more powerful is where you have more complex requirements, where you need something that's, that is a little more robust. So here, let me put it down. The number picker, or the spinner widget, actually ties into another jQuery project known as Globalize, which provides some internationalization ability for web applications. So all I have to do here is include Globalize. So there's a script tag with Globalize behind the scenes here. And then also give a number format of C, which tells the browser this is a currency input. And when I step now, my value of 25, I actually have a formatted currency value. And since this is driven by globalize, all I have to do if I want a different currency or a different culture is switch. So if I go, for instance, to German, I get a euro-based value. I can switch, for instance, to Japanese, and I'll be working in yen, which is pretty cool that you can do that in a single line of code. Um, and more to the point for that these widgets are really good for more complex interactions, this is actually a, a demo that's on jQuery UI's demo site, and it's for a time spinner widget. So all widgets built with jQuery UI are built with the widget factory, so you can just extend these widgets in a single line of code to add some additional functionality. And really, this is pretty short. All this is doing is, is two things. First, to configure some of these options, the step control and the page control, to work like basically um, to work with time to format to, to or, so they work like seconds and hours and then these functions here just basically format the values back and forth and with just those few lines of code 
I can build an actual time picker that can spin around minutes by default, and it'll actually go over the hour barriers here. But then also, because I, set, I defaulted the page value to work like hours, I can also use the page to work by hours. And since this is driven by globalize as well, if I want to sw uh, switch to a more sane time model, all I have to do is switch away from the US English. And that works as well. And again, there's a lot more. There's less options for Spinner, but it's still kind of more, more that it's a base to build more complex things on top of. Now, and I wanted to keep it this example going that it's just HTML on the DOM. So I built this. I tried to think of what I could build to make a Spinner look like it was dancing in CSS. And this is really the best I can come up with. But I wanted to make this example kind of realistic, so I made a Spinner to control that Spinner. That just controls how much that bounces up and down the screen. Now, obviously, this is a bit of a ridiculous example, but it just shows the type of things that are made possible with these JavaScript widgets. And to ask, the, ask the same question of can we get the best of both worlds, um, you again have the same problem when you try to take this approach that you get the, the double spinners. Now, in this case, they actually do both work by default, but it's obviously a bit strange. Um, you can use Shadow DOM again. You can hide those things pretty easily, and you get something that actually works pretty well in Chrome. This, the native validation is still going to work with this. You're still going to get the nice keyboard on mobile. So this actually feels pretty close. But again, the problem is this is, again, specific to Chrome. So when Fire, if you were to go with an approach like this, when Firefox ships their number picker in another couple of weeks, you'd have this problem. So unfortunately, the answer again is you really can't get the best of both worlds. But again, Spinner makes for a pretty nice polyfill. If you do have a simple requirement, you just need a number. You can detect whether support for the native number picker is available. And if it's not, only use the plugin under those circumstances. Um, the last example I want to talk about is ranges versus sliders. And I'm going to go even quicker because I want to make sure to get to the end. And the story is going to pretty much be the same. Now, Range pickers, it's the same basic story. You give a input, a type of range, and the browser will build a, a little range control like this. jQuery UI slider works a little bit differently in that it wants a div rather than an input type to turn into this slider control. But the end result is more or less the same functionally. The story for range support is actually really good. Firefox recently ships, shipped a version of it. IE10 had it. And pretty much all the mobile browsers have it at this point. So really, for most applications, the only real problem is some of the older IE versions. But that's becoming less and less of an issue. So range support is actually one story with these native controls where support is actually really good. And again, you get the mobile optimized inputs. Most of the mobile browsers draw this control kind of like the desktop browsers do. There's iOS's. Chrome for Android mixes it up a little bit with a little different handle. IE's control I actually quite like. They First of all, there's looks kind of unique, but they're the only browser that automatically builds this little tooltip for you showing the value, which I find that I end up manually creating kind of anyways. So I think it's kind of a neat implementation. You get ties into the min, max, and step attributes again. This, this code here is just outputting the value of the range into here, it's something that, that, thing that IE, IE does automatically for me. So again, I can just move between values of 0 and 100. You get data list integration as well. Um, actually, I don't know why it's not showing you. That's odd. Chrome normally draws little dashes on the. Let's see if I'll get it. Huh. Yeah, Chrome normally da uh, draws little dashes for you. Maybe they updated something and killed my presentation. But. Datalists will actually work with ranges. In IE, datalists are actually um, these little white bars. If you provide a datalist, it'll provide those as suggestions, suggested values for datalists on ranges. This is another one where there's actually quite a few pseudo elements across browsers that are specific to the browsers to style these controls. So for instance, in Chrome, if you wanted to build something silly like this, you can do things like can change, uh, control the color of these things. You can build silly things like this. But you can actually be pretty creative with this, these controls across browsers. jQuery UI slider to contrast. Um, obviously, you get the same min, max, and step attribute controls or um, uh, features. It's themable again, so we can switch up to Vader. Get a 
style theme. You get multiple handles. This thing is pretty common. I, I think the more common use case is this. If you've done any online shopping, usually there's some sort of filter control that looks like this. And this is actually something I actually, they, they're actually adding this to the spec. There's going to be a multiple attribute that you can add to range controls coming, but it's still in the early stages. No browsers have anything, but it's actually being added to the spec. So hopefully this type of thing will be possible in the browser directly in maybe a few years. Um, you can animate if you really want your handle to animate across. And you can do a bunch of other things. But again, it's more of a solid basis. So to keep my silly example going, I built a slider that just spins, a rainbow slider, I guess. And I built a slider to control how fast it spins. So this will slow it down. And if I want to give you all seizures, I can go to this. Since this is nice and keyboard accessible, too, I can do this. But I'll move on. On a more practical note, you can build some, some pretty cool controls with this as a basis. This is something, this isn't by anybody on the team, but this is just some, something somebody in the community made. So the first thing they did is they kind of took IE's approach of showing the tooltips with the actual values of these sliders, which I think is pretty handy. Um, but I guess what's really cool about this implementation is when you get these, these handles close to each other, they automatically collapse into one. And then when you get them on top of each other, they shrink down into a single value. And I think this was actually a really well done control and just sort of the thing that's made possible when you use these JavaScript widgets. And again, you can use slider as a polyfill if range support isn't available. The code's a little more complex, so I'll have the slides, I'll post the slides to this on, on my Twitter account after this. So if you want to look at how that sort of thing is possible, um, you could look at this link for it, more information. So that's kind of it, basically the, the summary of all of this. And I want to get into what, given all of this information, given how these controls work, what should you actually be doing today? So to kind of summarize, when you're using these native features, you get a control that's very easy to use, um, dependency-free. You get these other ties. But you also get something that it's really hard to build on top of. And as we saw, that you more or less have to pick one or the other. So, Really what I like to tell people is the native elements make a lot of sense when you have a very simple requirement. In the terms of the date control, it would be, I have a very simple control, I just need a date from the user. Or in the case of the number picker, I just need a number from the user. I don't need any special handling, I don't need any special theming, I just need data. And in those cases, that those native controls make a lot of sense because it uses a UI that the user is already familiar with. These controls also make a lot of sense if you have a high percentage of, mo of mobile users because giving the ability for the mobile browsers to customize these controls to do things like optimize the keyboards they see really help users complete these forms quicker. Now, but when you talk about JavaScript widgets, they still make a lot of sense if you have non-trivial requirements because those sort of things are still not going to be possible with the native controls. I mean, it can even be something as simple with a date picker of, I don't want to let the user pick weekend days you can't really enforce that sort of thing with the native controls. JavaScript widgets are also going to want to make sense if you want comprehensive browser support. If you just want a picker that works and you don't want to have to think about where it works and if I'm going to have to polyfill these things, the JavaScript widgets make a lot of sense for that as well. Now I will say two things. If, if you do actually want to use these native pickers and browser support is your problem, then I'll give two different options. The first is the one I showed earlier. You can detect support, and when support isn't available, you can use some JavaScript widget to polyfill in that functionality. So the user will always see a calendar, but they'll see the native control if it's available. And it doesn't even necessarily have to be a full, a full JavaScript widget that comes in. You can just even do something as simple as provide some contextual information when you detect that support actually isn't there and the user won't see a full calendar. And I wanted to show, this talk is mostly about jQuery UI, but I wanted to highlight that this really isn't a specific problem to jQuery UI. This is all JavaScript <coughs> widget libraries. So I mentioned I worked for Telerik earlier, and one of the products we make is Kendo UI. And I like to describe Kendo UI as jQuery UI++ because it has all the widgets that jQuery UI has, but then extra things like grids and schedulers and things like data visualization. And I wanted to show how Kendo UI approaches this problem. So if we have the same input type date and we turn it into a Kendo date picker, 
you can see that this calendar actually just works. We didn't have to do any hacks. And from the looks of it, this looks like magic, like Kendi UI actually solved this problem. But they actually didn't. We did something kind of, took a different approach under the hoods in that this input actually got switched back into a type text because otherwise we'd have the native controls kind of getting in the way. And you can kind of debate which approach is better. jQuery UI doesn't kind of mask over the problem for you. You get the two picker thing. And Kendi UI kind of makes it just work for you. It's kind of debatable what solution is better. But it's not like Kendi UI is immune to these problems. It's not like Dojo is immune or YUI. This is really a global problem. And it's kind of the same thing for the Kendi UI's number and range controls as well. These aren't actually the native controls. It's basically transforming them into text boxes and applying the custom widget from there. The other two I wanted to bring up are two mobile frameworks. If you look at jQuery mobile, you can see that jQuery mobile, at least for the date and number controls, they don't actually do anything other than styling the actual input box. And I think, so there's no custom calendar widget. Like they don't actually build a, a full calendar widget out for you. And this is really a testament to just how important leaving these native controls is on these mobile devices. And that pretty much all of these mobile frameworks chose, now you will find JavaScript widgets for, for mobile out there and out online. And there are some use cases for it. But for the most part on mobile, it's important to think of, or to consider using the native controls first. And as part of Kendi UI, there's another branch, Kendi UI Mobile, that is somewhat similar to jQuery Mobile as well. And I just wanted to show its approach as well. And it actually leaves the native controls in place as well. So it doesn't try to use Kendi UI Web's full calendar. It just realizes that the best control for the mobile device is this native date picker and just leaves that in place. So that's kind of the, the situation. And hopefully that gives you some, some ideas of what you can actually ship today in the apps that you're building. And if you have any other questions, any more specific questions, feel free to grab me. I'll be around. We can chat about any of that. But the last thing I want to talk about is the future. We talked about some definite problems here. And I want to talk about what's being done at the spec to actually make this better. Now, I guess the, more pop the most popular solution that came up a few years ago was, well, maybe we could just provide some way to tell the browser, I actually don't want you to implement your UI. Like, I want the things like the constraint validation. I want all the, the native ties. But really, just leave the UI up to me. And there were various flavors of this, UI equals false. There, was, there were several other things thrown around. But ultimately, the response from the spec was that the grand solution to this, the, the, the way we were going to handle this, was with web components, and that web components were the answer to this problem. Um, and what that means is, so we saw the Shadow DOM implementation earlier in Chrome. And one of the things that the web component spec allows you to do is you can add shadow roots, which are just basically the, the head of these, these um, shadow DOM implementations. You can basically just add your own shadow root to any elements. And this doesn't exclude form controls like inputs. So what I have here, and this is really recent. This has only worked since Chrome 31, which is like maybe two or three months old. But what you can do is say, OK, Give me a reference to the input. So this, tie, this corresponds to this input here. Create a new shadow root for me. And what this does is it says, insert another shadow root into the document and use my shadow root instead of the browser's implementation. Then you can say, OK, at this point, also insert my custom JavaScript control. I'll set the date format so it works. The, it gives me the same format data that the native control does. And then when the user selects a date, go ahead and throw that that value back into the Shadow DOM. And when you do that, you actually get something that actually works pretty well. And this looks like a pretty elegant solution. And it actually is. But there's some problems with this still that are, that are kind of um, in flux and being worked out in that when you substitute the native implementation of an input, you give up everything it is about being an input. So for instance, I can't actually use the keyboard with this control because I kind of forewent that when I, went, when I gave up that shadow root implementation. So there's some things being looked into where maybe there's some way of inheriting from the input so that you don't have to actually give up all of the input's functionality, but you still get a way of implementing your own control. But this is the sort of solution that the, the browser authors and the spec writers are actually looking into currently.
The other one is known as custom elements. I mentioned earlier that Web Components encompasses a few different types of specifications. The other one is custom elements, and it's basically just a way of making your own HTML elements. So you could build a box element, or in this case, you could actually, instead of using an input type date, why not just use a date picker element instead? Now, custom elements are kind of in flux. They're in Chrome behind a flag currently. But one thing that hasn't been addressed yet is that custom form elements, even in the latest, greatest nightly builds of Chrome, aren't possible. It's something that the spec authors haven't actually tackled yet. But it's something that is, is considered an idea for the future of this, that you'd be able to say, I actually want to build just a date element or a number element. And maybe having some mechanism to say, this is an extension of the input element. And this is how I want to build my form. So eventually, these sort of things are possible. And at least this is the direction that the spec is heading to address these issues. But these aren't things that you can actually use in an application today. Now, the one, the one final thing I want to mention is there's, there's also an input mode attribute. And this controls, like for instance, when you use jQuery UI spinner widget, and you know that you're accepting numbers, well, right now, you're still going to get the alphanumeric keyboard on mobile devices. And the input mode attribute is really offered as a solution to this. You could say, on a spinner control, jQuery I internally could say, actually, we're going to use input, input mode numeric for it, so that these mobile browsers, you could still use your JavaScript widgets and still get the niceties of the, the, the default keyboard entry on mobile devices. Now, I want to talk a little bit about how JavaScript libraries like jQuery UI and Kendo UI can actually help. And these libraries have an advantageous position here because they kind of get to see the problems and get to see how developers use these controls before they actually make it to the platform. And we can actually offer feedback to help make the platform better. And as a specific example of this, one thing I didn't mention is that input type numbers have this step up and step down methods. And these seem pretty straightforward. Here I have a value of 1, I call step up with 3, the value changes to 4. But the way this spec was actually originally written up is that when you called step up without any arguments, it would actually do nothing. It defaulted to stepping zero times. Which, this was one thing where the jQuery UI project lead actually brought it up to the spec and said, hey, so we have these methods, and this is kind of weird that this works this way. And we actually got the spec changed before any browsers were implementing these controls. Another thing is range orientation, and this one's still kind of ongoing. This way the spec is written up, if you want to create a vertical, a vertical range, so up and down, you just give the control a height that is greater than the width. And you'll see here that that's actually what I'm doing, and Chrome is not respecting my choice here, because Chrome is actually not following the spec and rendering a vertical slider here. Instead, they are using this pseudo, this proprietary pseudo class WebKit appearance in order to control the orientation of this range control. And this is actually something that jQuery UI has experienced as well. If you've used the slider for years, you may have remembered that the orientation option of the slider control actually used to default to auto. And what auto would do is it would try to magically figure out how you want, wanted your slider to, to work. It would say like, oh, well, it would do things like look at the height or the width, there are elements around it, and try to magically figure this out for you. But that ended up being problematic because people would do things like use a slider on multiple pages in their application, and then suddenly something about that page, some different CSS or whatever it might be, would just magically change this slider for them, or just some weird set of circumstance would do it. So we got some backlash against this, and we actually switched to an implementation where orientation defaults to horizontal, and then you have to opt in to vertical sliders, which is actually exactly like Chrome's current implementation. And so this is one, another one that we've provided feedback on. And this one's still ongoing. But right now, it's kind of sticking with the height greater than the width approach is the way to build vertical sliders. The, the last thing I want to mention is a lot of people think that as more of these native controls actually make it to the web, now that we can do a date picker in the browser, we can do number pickers in the browser, that eventually they're replacing these JavaScript libraries, that there won't be a place for things like jQuery UI and Kendo UI and all these other JavaScript libraries in the future. And I want to make the point that that's actually not the case at all. It's, if anything, it's actually more the opposite. And that there's always a place for these JavaScript widgets to build these more complex interactions. Um, a lot of production apps need something more than just these basic requirements. And we can actually see this in just sheer usage statistics. We know, for instance, that 
jQuery UI is used in an increasing number of websites. It's been a slow curve going up over the last five or six years. And actually, I pulled some data from just this year, and we've actually crossed the 20% barrier. So jQuery UI is now on 20% of the top 10,000 sites. Woohoo! Um, and Kendi UI as well. Kendi UI's usage is continuing to go up, and as is most of these JavaScript libraries. And so the last thing I want to say is um, if you're interested in helping, if you want to be a part of jQuery and jQuery UI, we're always looking for help. Feel free to contact me. Um, check out. There's plenty of things to do on the project. And as a last very shameless plug, I'm actually writing a book on jQuery at the moment. So if you're interested, feel free to check it out. And thanks. <laughs>